The last episode of this series mostly concerned the Carboniferous period. By this point, we finally crossed well into the Permian, and we're going to talk about a span of time between 280 to 260 million years ago, although some of the lineages that we mentioned may persist beyond that. The Permian was a relatively dry period, and progressively so, but it started out nearly as wet a climate as the Carboniferous, where most life on land was still closely tied to the waterways. While there weren't as many large amphibians as there were in the previous period, they are older than reptiles, and they had more time than reptiles to diversify. One noteworthy example is Prionosuchus. This is not a crocodile, nor is it what crocodiles came from. This is an amphibian that just looks like a crocodile. It's an example of convergent evolution. A handful of different lineages have tried this shape and apparently the lifestyle that goes with it. Even early whales started out like crocodiles when they still had legs. And this is what you get when evolution makes a crocodile out of a salamander. But it's not a crocodile, and it's not Prionosuchus either. This is Platyoposaurus, another amphibian living at the same time that also adopted the outfitting of a crocodile. And just for perspective, Here's an image of some of the amphibians of the Permian period. The smallest of them would be considered large by today's standards. Gerothorax, a transitional species between salamanders and frogs, was way bigger than any frog known to man. Ariops was bigger than the biggest amphibian alive today. Metaposaurus was as big as an alligator, and that's getting scary. But now, look at Prionosuchus. If these things were still around today, I probably wouldn't tell you that it's just an amphibian and not a crocodile, because at 30 feet long, you'd better treat it like it's the real thing. Of course, there weren't any actual crocodiles yet. Diapsid reptiles hadn't diversified that much in the lower Permian. And one of the laws of evolution is that the further back in time you look, the simpler and more similar living things appear to be because they're more closely related. Diapsids in the lower Permian are a good example of that, because the ancestors of dinosaurs, pterosaurs, phytosaurs, plesiosaurs, ichthyosaurs, placodons, and sphetodons, and a mess of other things you probably never heard of, all look just like different species of lizards. Although there weren't any actual lizards yet either, ironically. By that time, reptiles had barely divided into archosaurs and lepidosaurs, the two main branches of the reptile family tree, but the early members of both of those groups still looked pretty much like each other. Nor had any of them gotten very big yet, either. This seven-foot-long Thalatosaurus is among the biggest of them, and that's another reason for small children to be careful along the water's edge. Probably the most interesting of the true reptiles of that age is Salurosaur avis, which had an extra set of rib attachments that it could use as wings for gliding. At that time, the only things that were capable of actual powered flight were insects. And dragonflies were still pretty big then, even though the spike of atmospheric oxygen that we saw in the Carboniferous was on its way back down to a level that we would consider normal today. And Permian forests still had primitive ferns and even horsetails, which are both small today, but back then they grew to trees that are 100 feet tall. Otherwise, the world of the Permian wasn't that much different than the climate many of us grew up in. It was seasonal, with warm summers and winters that could be as cold as they get now. Last episode, we talked about how pelicosaurs could have used their sail fins as solar panels to warm up on chilly mornings, but that only works if the sun is out. So if they were going to inhabit more temperate zones, they needed a better system. And the reason that we shiver when we're cold is because constant minuscule muscle spasms can generate a bit of heat. If you're a cold-blooded animal, then that little bit can make a difference, especially if you can't get the warmth of direct sunlight. And some fish, like tuna, for example, have the ability to raise the temperature of some parts of their body. So the transition from ectothermic to endothermic was another gradual change where some transitions are only slightly warm or maybe only partially so. If such spasms occur internally, like repeatedly constricting certain blood vessels, that can actually raise the temperature of the blood itself, which of course would, could make the whole animal warm. The last episode got as far as spinacodonts. To get from them to therapsids, we'll look at another example of transitional species. And this lizard-looking thing is Tetraceratops, like Triceratops, but with four horns. Actually, it has six horns, because there's two more on its jaw. Seems they found the skull and named it before they could get a good look at its jaw, too. It qualifies as a transitional species because there's some dispute over which side it's on. Some say it's too primitive to be a therapsid, but it's apparently too advanced to be just another pelicosaur. With six spiky little horns, as well as oversized canines and pointy incisors, this was not a kissable face. But it gets worse. Looking at uncontroversial or universally accepted therapsids, we first see the basal group Biarmasuchians. They don't have a bunch of sharp spikes on their faces, but they're known for having grotesque lumps all over their heads, as if they'd all been beaten with an ugly stick. 
Getting out of the basal group, we move to eutherapsids, the true therapsids. Although one of their subgroups, dinocephalians, really aren't all that advanced. Hey, I had one of these in my prehistoric playset as a boy. Remember, these are not dinosaurs. They're called mammal-like reptiles, but they're not really even reptiles. Their hips are becoming more like that of mammals, and their legs aren't as widely sprawled as typical reptiles either. Instead, they're positioned to hold the body up higher, to support the weight better, and to walk more efficiently. So these are, you know, transitional species. And some of the earliest examples of eutherapsids are Astemidosuchus. Whoa, there's a Halloween mask for you. Now, some of these hideous monstrosities got as big as bison. And notice how their half dozen horns seem to match those of Tetraceratops? It's almost as if they're related. It's hard to tell just from fossils, but many of these were plant eaters despite their dentition. Remember, they'd just recently begun to differentiate their teeth and haven't produced any plant grinding molars yet. So when you look at these animals with oversized tusk-like teeth and try to picture them as plant eaters, think of pigs or hippos. In fact, one of them is even called Hipposaurus. Then we move to new therapsids, Neotherapsidae although they're not really new, are they? Almost every lineage you see here is extinct. Only one out of all these lines has any living relatives, which is strange because another of these lines was for a time one of the most prolific and abundant tetrapod species ever on every continent around the planet, although they're all extinct now and have been for hundreds of millions of years. But we're gonna call them new therapsids because they're newer than the even older ones. These are Dasonodonts, known for their tusks and their otherwise toothless beaks. Tusks and beaks with no teeth. There's an intelligent design. Look at this awful thing. Man, there's a whole lot of ugly in the therapsid family tree. Yeesh! These are the most awkward bogans in the whole trailer park. How did these things eat plants if they didn't have any molars? Same way turtles do. Chop it up with their sharp bladed beaks. And many of these weird beasts lived in herds analogous to today's cattle, while other therapsids played the part of cats or bears, and some even specialized in the role of moles. So we had the kind of diversity we see today, but where every niche is occupied by the wrong thing, between the hipposauruses and crocomanders and turtle cows and flying squirrel lizards. So understanding how ridiculously hideous some of this clan happened to be, you may be embarrassed to be associated with them, but do you have the traits to identify you as one among them? Do you shiver when you're cold? Uh, have you ever had a fever? Otherwise, is your normal body temperature about the same, no matter whether it's hot or cold outside? And are your legs directly beneath you, like columns to support your weight, as opposed to... <laughs> if so, the test results are positive. You are the Rhapsody.